This episode of the Demonic Compendium contains spoilers for the following games. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to a nice new episode of the Demonic Compendium, the show where I discuss the mythology, design, and game history of your favorite Megami Tensei demons. I know the wait for this episode has been long and hard, even though we all knew it would eventually come. Well, now it's here, so lie back, put your feet up, get comfortable, and get ready to f Because today, I am finally talking about Mara. Mara is a well-known and feared figure in Buddhist mythology. He's a powerful and wicked demon lord whose primary existence was to try and tempt weak-willed people away from enlightenment. One interesting facet of Mara is that there are four distinct versions of him. There's Klesa Mara, who exists as a general embodiment of incompetence and negative emotion, Mritu Mara, as a void-like embodiment of death itself, Skanda Mara, who represents the idea of conditioned existence, and lastly, Deva Uktra Mara, who is the only one of the four that seems to exist with a physical form, and not as some malevolent metaphorical force. As such, it's also the one most stories, and probably Megami Tensei itself, seems to focus on. Now, trying to compile a full history of Mara is a near impossible task. Even people way smarter than me who are experts on the subject have said as much. But I can at least try and explain one of the most well-known tales of this terrible tempter. The central figure in our story today is, and I apologize if I pronounce this wrong, Siddhartha Gautama the man most of us would eventually refer to as Buddha. While attempting to seek enlightenment by meditating under the Bodhi tree, Mara knew that if Gautama were to succeed, his power over all mortals would be decimated. So he tried trick after trick in order to prevent the would-be Buddha from achieving enlightenment. Much like how a certain coyote tries trick after trick to catch a certain speedy bird. Among these ruses were Mara disguising himself as a messenger and telling Gautama that another monk was totally going to reach enlightenment first if he wasn't stopped. Mara tried sending his three daughters, Surna, Radhi, and Raga, to try and seduce Gautama, although some stories say all three of these women were just Mara in disguise. He tried sending powerful rain and wind to chase away even the gods themselves that stood in support of the would-be Buddha. Really, no matter what Mara attempted, Gautama remained in meditation underneath the tree. Eventually, Mara called upon armies of demons and rode his great elephant, Girimakala, to attack Gautama. He called out that none would be witness to Gautama's feats. The soon-to-be Buddha spoke calmly, and he claimed the earth itself would be his witness before touching his hand softly to the earth, causing Mara's mount and the entire demon army to bow in reverence. Gautama achieves enlightenment and drives the fierce demon lord away. Now, of course, there are several versions of this story, and the one I'm telling is incredibly abridged, but Mara essentially exists as a metaphor for temptation, desire, and other negative emotions that prevent human beings from reaching inner peace and an existence free of desire. Mara's compendium entry from Shin Megami Tensei Liberation D2 refers to him as the Hardbringer of Death, a Hindu demon that dominates spirits and holds the power to instill fear. During his meditations, Buddha almost gave in to his temptation when Mara seduced him under a linden, a hardwood tree. Mara's great power was a sight to behold. His rigid strength spread far and wide, giving birth to many vile creatures. Design-wise! Do, do, do I have to? Yeah, alright, that's what the people are here for, right? <clears throat> Mara's a dick. I don't mean like a jerk or anything. I mean from day one, he's been a walking, talking dick. Who eventually became way more well-known as a giant dick rolling around in his golden chariot. I've read some sources claiming Mara's design is meant to represent the three big forms of lust. His physical body obviously being a lust for sex, the chariot being gold representing a lust for wealth, and the giant blades adorning it showcasing a lust for violence. But the question to answer today is, why? Why is Mara the way that he is? Well, the short and simple answer is because Mara is a common Japanese slang term for penis. 
The term primarily gained traction with Japanese monks because in certain versions of the story where Mara attempts to overthrow Buddha with his army of demons, he rode into the battle wearing an incredibly phallic headdress in an attempt to shock Gautama into breaking out of his meditation. Several Japanese shrines dedicated to phallic worship or fertility contain the name Mara, such as the Mara Kanan Temple in Nagato, and even the yearly Kanamara Matsuri Festival, or Festival of the Steel Phallus, that takes place in Kawasaki highlights Mara's connection to the baloney pony. While it's incredibly easy to giggle and point at Mara as haha the big penis monster, there actually is some genuine meaning and mythological significance behind his appearance. Sure, there are definitely other, more subtle ways Kaneko could have gone about it, but then we wouldn't have the big penis monster, now would we? Most other versions of Mara throughout the franchise are merely deviations on his already established prowess, such as combining Mara's most notable feature with the existing slime model, or making a few tweaks to turn him into a character's persona. Just example after example of d I think pretty much the only game where he's not some form of giant penis is in Last Bible Special. Alright, I think I handled all that well enough, let's move on. As far as game history goes, Mara has quite a few notches on his bedpost, appearing in nearly every major series in the franchise, often with multiple roles stuffed to the brim with innuendo. Mara's first major role comes to us in Shin Megami Tensei 2, where he appears as a boss fight, and true to his mythology, he will attempt to tempt LF with things such as Maka, level increases, or promises of ultimate power. And naturally, you must never give in to Mara's temptations. Unless he offered me a night with Dormarth. But thankfully, Dormarth didn't exist yet. Whew, actually, you know what? I'm not sure if I've got the stamina to plow through all of Mara's sexcapades by myself. Well, they say a problem shared is a problem halved, so I've invited a few friends to chime in and share some of their favorite Mara moments and help me handle this massive load. One of Mara's most well-known and infamous appearances is in Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. After completing the obelisk, the Demi-Fiend can return to Shibuya and enter a hidden room towards the back of Shibuya's streets. If this room is entered at a full Kagetsuchi, a duo of mannequins will be conducting a ritual with Baphomet to summon Mara to do their bidding. Unfortunately, their eagerness causes Mara to come prematurely giving us the first ever appearance of Slime Mara, who must be defeated in order to obtain the Moosebell Magatama. Slime Mara will make a comeback in the MMO title Shin Megami Tensei Imagine. And as of the time of making this video, Imagine is the only game where Slime Mara can be obtained as a demon partner. In one event, Slime Mara is once again summoned by Baphomet in a direct callback to Nocturne. But in a later event, the full-bodied Mara that we're all familiar with is introduced, as well as having him be added to the Abyss Tower as a high-level boss. He has the skills Mara La Agidine and the Curse Spit. You, you really can't make this stuff up. Mara also appears in Shin Megami Tensei's Strange Journey, with a fairly major role as one of the many Mother Goddesses. On the Chaos Path, she'll hire the protagonist to defeat the Seraph, after which, she can be unlocked for fusion and also create the most powerful gun in the game, the Peacemaker. But on the lawful route, Mara is instead fought as a boss under orders from the Seraph. A unique Mara can also be summoned via password in Strange Journey. In the Japanese version, typing in Eiji Ishida, the game's director, gave players a powerful Mara with skills like Riot Gun and Victory Cry. However, in the localized version, that password was changed to Nick Maragos, a member of Atlas USA who spearheaded the localization on many titles for the company, including Strange Journey. This is doubly funny, since you can't spell Nick Maragos without Mara. I guess it should also be mentioned that when Atlas Japan held their great big demon popularity poll to celebrate the release of Strange Journey Redux, Mara came in first, so when I open every episode with your favorite Megami Tensei demons, in Mara's case there's some definitive proof of that. Mara makes a comeback in both Shin Megami Tensei 4 and Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. In the former, he must be fought as a terminal guardian, but in Apocalypse his role is a lot bigger as he's a major force behind the cult of Maruology, a hedonistic sex cult. 
In battle, Mara will mostly use Health Thrust, and in a few cases even try to tempt Inashi, similar to what he did in Shin Megami Tensei 2. Mara also has a few unique roles in the mobile title Shin Megami Tensei Liberation D2, appearing as a major figure in the special event, keeping evil at bay, and as one of the main antagonists in the Hollow World Aura Gate, where he's one of the most infamous and annoying bosses in the entire game. I don't have footage of that because Oragate 2 sucks and I hate it and I'm still stuck on floor 20, but in keeping evil at bay, Mara stands tall as his usual innuendo-filled self and spews miasma and summons snake demons as his minions. He's eventually stopped by the D2s, Maha Mayori, and Take Minakata. In Shin Megami Tensei 5, Lord Mara returns and has unique conversations with a couple of demons. He has a conversation with his mount, Garam Kala where the two reminiscence fondly on the days when they ride everywhere together, but lament that they're not up to riding in their old age. Mara also has a conversation with Slime as a direct callback to his side quest in Nocturne, wondering if he was recently a Slime himself or if it was all in his imagination. All good for now, isn't it? But then, Slime makes a comment about brains leaking out of Mara's head. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it's kind of a mental image I definitely didn't want in my mind. Mara has had several roles in the Persona series, starting in the very first Persona game. During the opening acts of the Snow Queen quest, Kenta Toro Yokouchi awakens to Mara in a rather unusual manner that feels more like that one scene from Alien. Or Spaceballs. But this awakening causes Yuka Ayase to awaken to her Persona in retaliation. While the game itself never states this persona to be Mara, it is referred to as such in one of the drama CDs, and in the manga, Toro's persona resembles more of a turtle head in order to avoid it needing to be censored. Despite being absent from the original Persona 3, Mara joined the party with several roles throughout FES and Portable worthy of mention. First of all, he's a member of the Tower Arcana, because of course he is and can only be created via a special pentagram fusion consisting of Incubus, Pazuzu, Matisse, Mott, and Kumanda. Five personas that have absolutely nothing in common that would hint towards Mara. So, have you ever noticed how Mara kind of sounds like Maragi? Well, apparently the devs noticed too. Enter Maralagi Dine. It is a multi-target burst of green goo that attacks all foes and stands out as the strongest fire-based attack in the game. This attack is only available in Persona 3 Portable and Persona 5 Strikers, with Persona 5 Strikers only allowing you to use it via a specific button combo while having Mara as your active Persona, and Persona 3 Portable also allowing you to acquire it as a skill card to distribute it because yes, we needed all our Personas to learn how to shoot green fiery goo of questionable origin. Not only does Mara have access to the best fire spell in the game, but fusing Mara with a Nile weapon in the antique shop creates Evil Gloves, the strongest glove weapon in Persona 3. That thankfully doesn't look nearly as horrifying as it could have been. On top of that, the game even has a unique easter egg that pops up if a player enters the Velvet Room with Mara equipped. If you enter the Velvet Room with your big Mara equipped to Makoto, Elizabeth will be mildly amused and say the Persona is very manly for him. However, if Katone enters, Theo will be absolutely shocked, stating that a Persona is completely unladylike. Elizabeth also has unique dialogue for Katone, but John didn't record any footage of that. After a prolonged absence, Slimara makes his return in Persona 5 under his shadow name, the Torn King of Desire. In Vanilla P5, he appears as a miniboss blocking the stairs towards the end of Kamashita's palace, while in Persona 5 Royal, he shows up in the underground waterway blocking the Blue Will Seed. Regardless of the version you choose, An is not happy to see him, and he'll occasionally waste his own turn simply staring at her. <sighs> The fully formed Mara also appears in the momentous mission, the head honcho of showbiz. Very fittingly, Mara is the demon form taken by Shiro Asakura's shadow, a producer with a well-known reputation of sexually harassing young women in the industry and in his vice primarily targets female party members. Speaking of Memento's mission and Asakura, his storyline is one of the major arcs in the three-part manga Persona 5 Memento's mission, where they tied in the character Mika from An's Confidant. Mara comes back in Persona 5 Strikers through the special request The Writhing Nightmare Rises, 
The Phantom Thieves must journey to the end of the Cage of Desolation and face off against the throbbing King of Desire. Completing this mission for the first time rewards players with Zenkichi's ultimate weapon, Gram, a great sword fueled by burning rage. Aside from Shin Megami Tensei and Persona, Mara also has his fair share of roles in the Devil Summoner series. In Devil Summoner Soul Hackers, Mara appears as the final boss of the Vision 2 in the Corridor of Time. Only after defeating Mara and four other bosses in this optional dungeon will players be able to grant access to the game's feature, New Game Plus. In Devil Summoner 2, Raido Kuzunoha vs. King of Baden, Mara appears in two separate case files. He appears in Seventh Trumpet, Eternal King, as one of Lucifer's main generals that Raido must defeat in order to prove his mettle, and also appears in Fake Raido Spotted, where Raido must climb to the top of the erect radio tower where he previously fought Mishiguchi, and meet up with the Raido from another dimension who had been chased here by Mara. A demon so powerful he claims will be taken down with one thrust. Mara apparently can't last very long since you only have five minutes to win this fight. Speaking of Mishiguji, Mara has a unique conversation with this demon in King Abaddon, where the two ponder why the other feels so familiar to them, and wonders if there's anything that they have in common. Which, of course they do. They're both boss fights fought at the top of the radio tower. I already mentioned that. Since the very first episode of this show, Mara has frequently been one of, if not the, most highly requested demon for me to cover, and I'm really glad I found the perfect time and place to talk about this infamously iconic figure. I want to give extra special thanks to all my friends in the Megami Tensei community for lending me their time and talent to be a part of this video. You'll find links to all their channels in the description below. And there you have it, Mara, the memified meat mast, mainly mucking up my monetization and mortifying my mother. Did I leave out something you thought was important? Was I just plain wrong about something? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to let me know who you'd like to see me talk about in future episodes. That's going to do it for this episode of the Demonic Compendium, and I'll see you next time. But be careful while you rest that a demon doesn't take over your body. Hey, thanks for watching the long-awaited video on Mara. I don't normally do this, but since this video probably got demonetized, why not consider pledging to my Patreon? One dollar a month helps the channel immensely and allows me to keep making the demon-related content you all love to see. Even if you can't donate, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, take care.